Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by Vicky O'Neon, who is a drummer, educator, and a YouTuber who you've probably seen on social media and uh, and all that good stuff. So, Vicky, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Yeah, this is, uh, this is going to be a fun one because you have done an amazing job creating a series um, on YouTube and on Instagram, which, you know, it's shared on both on YouTube called Drumming Through the Decades, and it is just awesome and very in-depth and very colorful, which is uh, part of your <laughs> <laughs> your style. So why don't you, before we start and learn about um, really the you know famous drummers through the decades with kind of an emphasis on female drummers, why don't you tell us about this series? Yeah. Okay. So Drumming Through the Decades is a 12-episode YouTube series. It's an educational platform that covers the evolution of the drum kit, rhythms, and genres, whilst highlighting female-identifying drummers and musicians. So the series starts 2000 BC, when all drummers actually used to be women, and then it continues all the way up to 2021. Mm. And the purpose of the series is to present the female perspective that has so often been left out in the history of music and illuminate the stories of m- so many incredible women who have been forgotten today. Yeah. So I'm both the presenter and the producer of the series, and I've done in-depth research for this. Uh, and it's been such an amazing journey just to discover all these amazing women that's been there and so many of them I had never heard of and I've been involved professionally as a drummer for the past decade so I'm hoping that this uh, series will educate people and therefore also reduce gender inequalities within the drum and music industry Mm. and this project is supported by the Swedish Cultural Foundation in Finland and there is subtitles in English and Swedish available and there can also be more language subtitles added in different languages by request wow cool that is uh you've got your uh your your pitch there down I mean that is (laughs) that is great and it's really really cool um just like you said to be more inclusive and I think there are I'm I'm it's I try to do it on the show and have a lot of have more female guests, but um, it is kind of a male heavy world. And I think you're doing yeah. a great job of of sort of changing that and showcasing um, really, really great female drummers and just you yourself doing it and being a successful uh, working uh, performing, which we can talk about your awesome, you know, decade long, like you said, career um, towards the end. But so you've got my interest here about 2000 B.C it was all female drummers. Why don't we explain that a little bit? Right. Yeah. So this was such an in- interesting discovery that I had myself when I started to research this series. And I was like, wow. So 2000 BC and even earlier than that, apparently all drummers used to be women because they were the leaders of all artistic and religious activities mm. in society. So that would be natural back then because the drum was considered a feminine object and the heartbeat of mother earth and women were considered magical creatures thanks to their ability to give birth to new life and the drum was a major symbol for fertility Mm. and sexuality so they used to use uh, frame drums back then made from grain sieves um, and we have the first drummer in recorded history. Her name is Li Xiao, and that's 2000 BC. So that's why I sort of reference 2000 yeah. BC as a date, although this was happening already prior to that. And mm. Li Xiao, she was a Mesopotamian drumming priestess in the city-state Ur, and her role was to be a mediator between the divine and human realms. And her emblem of office was a small round fra- frame drum called a, a balagdi. So, so women were often almost like shamans, both in the Eastern and Western cultures. And they were known to use drumming for healing rituals. So that's mm. sort of like the, the background, really. Yeah, that's unbelievable. That. I've heard it on on the show a little bit before um, on a way earlier episode, but I love about the the mother drum and the heartbeat and the fertility and just the importance of all that. Uh, it's, it's it's in our human nature. 
It really is. I listened to that uh, interview actually, which is great. Yes. Because thank you. She she went in more depth into this the early history. Yeah. So I'm not going to go too much into depth of the early history. Yeah. But yeah. if that's something that listeners are interested in, I mean sure. that that interview is awesome. And that was with Angela Sells. Um, and that was long enough in, ago for me to be dangerous about what I've forgotten. <laughs> it's like two and a half years ago. So wow. I won't try and uh, pretend like I remember a ton. I need to re-listen to it. But but yeah, that makes perfect sense. That's a very in-depth um, episode about that. All right. Yeah. So carry on from there. Yeah. So my series focuses mainly on this past century, but I'm just giving a little bit of background yeah. story in the beginning. So sure. I'm just going to do a little bit more background story, but still jumping quite quickly into our last century. Sure. So so if we move forward in time from 2000 BC and we sort of hit the medieval times, which is around 5th century until the 15th century, that's uh, when all of this changed uh, drastically and drumming during the medieval times became associated with pagan rituals. And the church banned many instruments, rhythms, melodies, and priests were now considered the primary musicians. Mm. And women uh, were forbidden to sing or play instruments altogether and were generally given a very oppressed role in society. So by introducing these bands, women's powers as artistic and spiritual leaders was now completely removed and their voices were silenced. So this is where we saw this massive shift and what's going to happen from now onwards is basically discovering, well, what's happened since then and how ha have women found their way back to the drums, you know? Man, I mean, it's just like that switch, like you said, mm -hmm. women finding their way back, but talk about how, I mean, that really set female musicians and drummers back. I mean, yeah. they, and, and obviously there's some very, uh, things have been getting much, much better. And that was so long ago, but it's just amazing how one thing in history can change uh, so much. And it's yeah, just not and how fair. it takes hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years yeah. after that, you know? Yeah. Um, but we had these, um, these women throughout history who's been sort of like leading the way. So, for example, in, in the 1100s, uh, we had uh, St. Hildegard from Germany who is considered to be the first singing superstar nun. Mm. And, and she defied the laws around music making at the time. And as a result, there are actually more surviving chants by Hildegard than by any other composer from the entire Middle Ages. Wow. Um, yeah, which is, which is great. And she also included the sacrilegious tambourine in her practice. <laughs> <laughs> Man, it's like a uh, medieval version of Sister Act with Whoopi Goldberg, where... Uh... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. Um, and then we had, that's too uh, yeah. cool. Okay. And then in the 1500s, we had Teresa of Avila, who was another superstar nun who great, greatly contributed to the to the change in views on music and instruments within the church by secretly teaching other nuns to sing and play. And she also redeemed the drum as an appropriate vehicle for Christian praise and worship. Hmm. So, so she was. Yeah, she she's a very important person in yeah. terms of just bringing the drum back into the context of, you know, not not considering it a devil's instrument sure. anymore. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's interesting how the church is so closely tied to it. Where a lot of times in other you know episodes, it's all about how um, like military bands is so important and tied to drumming and the uh, the like uh, evolution of drumming. But this yeah. early on, it's like the church was kind of controlling everything yeah. so if you're okay with the church then you're okay with you know to do whatever you want but i guess these these women these pioneering women had to like make it okay right right mm. yeah interesting yeah and and mi and the military will later on because now we're sort of getting into the 1800s sure. and that's where military drumming was really the precursor to what then eventually became the drum kit yep. as we know it today yep. um yeah, so 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 there was more and more in the 1800s. We we started to see more uh, female composers like Clara Shawman and Ethel Smith, who was an active campaigner who wrote the March of the Women, which became the anthem anthem of the suffragettes. So we saw more women start to compose and start to play instruments. But now we had this 
we, we had this idea introduced of masculine and feminine instruments. Mm. Um, and women were only really performing in private. They were not allowed to perform in public. And drums were definitely not acceptable for women to play. And even string instruments were considered unfeminine at the time. So feminine and acceptable instruments in the 1800s was the piano, mm. the harpsichord, or the harp. So there was a few women who, who started their own orchestras, but they were never really taken seriously and could rarely get, get any work because most men didn't think it was appropriate for women to become serious musicians. Mm. And another name for orchestras at the time was men only clubs, which is quite interesting. It's so bizarre. It's like, <laughs> I know it is bizarre. It's an orchestra, which now, <laughs> I mean, not even player wise, but just I think of it not being female to be interested in the orchestra and stuff, but it's very yeah. gender. It's a very what's what am I trying to say? It's kind of more of a sensitive thing, like symphonies and orchestras to go and to, to go to them. I don't think of it as being a big men's club and you go to an orchestra no. and what, you know, it's no. just it's just sort of different. So, so there we can see that the times have definitely changed yeah. since then. For right? sure. For sure. Yeah. And we had one of the, the first documented all-female orchestras is the Vienna Ladies Orchestra, which was founded in 1867. And mm. they did have uh, members representing all instruments within an orchestra and even the so-called masculine ones like trombone, trumpet, and drums. And they toured the U.S., but they weren't allowed to play. They just played like beer joints and smaller places like that because they weren't really allowed to play any any bigger places. And that was already ve very controversial what they were doing. But they did go on tour to the U.S. And um, that gave rise to some all-female orchestras in the U.S. as well, like the Fedet Lady Orchestra, which was an orchestra that existed for over 40 years and had more than 600 women playing in it. Wow. And and why why they created all female orchestras was simply because they weren't allowed to play with the men. <laughs> so yeah, uh, yeah. So yeah. you wouldn't see cross, you know, like gender uh, performances, I guess, really, e no. ever. No, that came that came later on. Mm. I think that came sort of in the twenties. We started to see that, but prior to that, no. Wow. The few the few women we saw. Well, then that was simply simple reason for it because they they literally weren't allowed. To wow, play with it's men. such a tough thing. I mean, and you think of these women like traveling in a foreign country that's like you know so far from home by themselves, and they're doing something that's like pushing the limits. It's like yeah, very controversial. Very, at the time. Yeah, good for very, them. Thanks a lot yeah, of guts. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and as the and as the drum kit is an American invention, which we will talk about in a little bit but this also paved the way for female drummers to start entering the scene the fact that there was some more female orchestras actually that started to appear yeah um and as women weren't allowed to play the drums it wasn't actually uncommon that young girls would dress up you could see like young girls like orphans or abused children even like wives and prostitutes that would cut their hair short and dress up in me in male clothes to disguise themselves as boys and join the army. Hmm. So they would become wow. so-called drummer boys because that were that was a place where you where you were allowed to play drums. Like we were saying, the military was sort of like the primary place to for drumming. Hmm. Uh, Crazy! Uh, I've at, never at heard that. Time. Yeah, and there is, for example, an English folk song that it, which is called "The Pretty Drummer Boy." And some of the words there is like, with the fine cup and feathers, likewise the rattling drum, they learned her to play upon the rabba dabba dum. With her gentle waist so slender and her fingers long and small, she could play upon the rabba dum, the best of them all. So there's like songs <laughs> with lyrics about drummers wow. being women already back then. Man, that's and so cool. That's. <laughs> I've heard about kids being, you know, so much younger and they kind of fake their age and they slip in. But like, uh, that's that's a whole new element to the history there and and, and beautifully sung, might I add. Oh, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> it was good. So then when we're moving into the, um, the like the early 20th century, early 1900s, um, then we started to see uh, vaudeville shows appear, which provided cheap entertainment to the new working class. And this was a place where women and Afro-American entertainers were allowed to uh, were allowed to perform. 
So, so, so at least, uh, although these shows can be criticized in their own ways, kind of like the the precursor to musicals yes, as we know them sure. today. Um, so, but at, at least these places gave uh, gave women a platform, yeah, to showcase their skills. Uh, uh, at least they were legally allowed to do that there. Yeah, there's um, definitely some things that would not be like the minstrel shows and all that that are not great and. You know, but it was a different time. I guess it was a, it's a stepping, it's just each. It's a stepping stone. Yeah. yeah that has, a lot of things can be criticized about those uh, places. And one of them is, for example, that, that when the vaudeville show owners uh, noticed that actually women brought a big crowd, they, they started to sort of uh, describe the shows as a, as a kind of sex show, you know? Yeah. And they realized that this could be a very lucrative market. So they st started to book more and more women and especially the beautiful ones. Gotcha. So, wow. so women has like from get go have uh, the ones who have been playing an instrument have always been, there's been more interest in their appearance rather than their musical ability from the beginning. There is like in the, in the second episode of the of drumming through the decades, there is a recital, uh, like a review from a harpist from the 18th century, where it's like in three words it describes her ability to play. She was a great harp player, and then for the rest of the whole article, it's just uh, talking about her appearance and how great she looked behind mm. the harp, showing her full figure. And it's just like it's, it's always been there, and it's still there today. I was going to say that know? seems that's still <laughs> kind of happening, and it's not very you know, and it and it happens in with male performers as well a little bit where people are kind of like, you know, the hunky singer or whatever, but it's also, mm -hmm. it's less like degrading, you know what I mean? Yeah. And if yeah. it's, it's, but yeah, that's not, um, that's just terrible. It's, it's been like that forever, obviously. It but. has. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I just hope we will, we will get to a point. I mean, it, it depends on, I guess, what which scene and what context today because it's not like that everywhere yeah but that people would be appreciated for their their playing their their musicality their musicianship rather than anything else really sure. so just like general interesting facts that was happening around this time uh was that the like the stepping stone towards the first d drum kit was double drumming mm -hmm. where you would have the the bass drum raised up and a snare drum and you would play that with your hands. And then we also saw the invention of the first bass drum pedal in 1909 by Ludwig and uh, an early styles of music uh, that was, that was popular and that was played with the, with the double drumming was ragtime. And here we introduced um, syncopation and these um, uh, offbeat rhythms that were so controversial at the time but has then come to nominate like all music, all popular music that we've seen since then pretty much. Yeah, yeah, which goes to show everything that's kind of uh, uh, risque at one point kind of becomes the norm later. So that's maybe a mm -hmm. sign mm -hmm. of something good coming down the road. Uh, yeah, and it's also interesting to see how African-Americans have had the most influence on all music that we've really seen in this last century and who, how we see these repeated patterns of uh, them creating something incredible, something amazing. And uh, at first it's, uh, they can't get exposure for that anywhere. And then white musicians comes and makes, makes it super famous and popular and makes loads of money from it. Yeah. <laughs> We've seen that so many times. The history repeats itself there, yeah. which is so so frustrating to say, but that's that that's that's the facts of what's happened. It is. And I don't think that's too like that's not even up for debate. That is exactly pretty much what has happened. Yeah. Yeah. So another interesting thing, just drum related thing uh from like the nineteen tens uh was uh, trap drummers. Um, and it's a very different kind of trap from the trap that we know today. Um, but it was basically drummers that were hired to, to, to play for silent movies or to accompany dancers on stage. And they would have a tray uh, with different contraptions on it with like just loads of random sounds because they would have to emulate loads of different kinds of sounds, sounds of trains, sounds of barking dogs, crying babies and so on. 
so so this um, contraption tray was shortened trap. So their drum kits would used to be called trap kits, and they used to be called trap drummers. So that's just an interesting oh, little yeah. fact. <laughs> Until 1927, when uh, everything kind of came to an end with the talkies. But, talkies, um, yeah. Um, okay, yeah. So then we're moving into the the twenties when we start to see the early drum recordings, and uh, and we and we see Dixieland jazz appear, uh, which came from the original Dixieland jazz band. That's where the name came yep. from, and that was sort of like the the popular music that was played, and that was played on the drum kit. Um, and we also had the blues and um, and. We had Bessie Smith, for example, um, who is one of the biggest blues singers, definitely the biggest one of the 1920s. Um, and she was sort of brought up by Ma Rainey, which is the mother of blues. Yeah. Uh, so so both of them are important women for, for the blues. Um, and we also had uh, more all-female orchestras that we saw. So, because bands now started to get more and more uh, so sophisticated, and we started to see big bands appear, and some of the all-female orchestras from the time was called the Blue Bells, the Parisian Redheads, Lil Hardin's All Girl Band, and Harlem Playgirls. Mm. If anyone wants to check them out, totally. and uh, and the most famous group from this. Uh, era was founded by a man called Phil Spitalney, and he realized that he could reach success by gathering some of America's greatest female musicians. And the group had their own radio show called Spitalney's Hour of Charm, which introduced them to thousands of listeners and introduced uh, and inspired a whole new generation of women to pick up an instrument. And Spitalney's group was so successful that its sound and character became synonymous with all girl bands for many years to come mm. after that. That's interesting. Yeah. And it's, yeah. it's, um, it's so you said it inspired women for generations to come. I just think that's so neat. Cause it, I'm thinking like, God, not only to like join a group, but like to take the time you, I'd feel like you'd be a, a young girl and you'd be like wanting to learn the drums. And I feel like a lot of people be like, like, no, you're not allowed to like their parents totally. or whatever. It, it seems like it's so totally. like, far-fetched at that time for a girl to want yeah. to learn that it's like you'd have to like kind of go against the grain and like what your parents are telling you i'm com completely creating a you know this fictitious like <laughs> thing in my yeah, mind but like yeah, you know that, i mean that that's that's still happening today yeah and and the difference to that you know like i can only imagine i can't even imagine what it was for them back then and and it's just incredible like that's why i really really rate these women so much yeah because what they had up against them and just seeing how the industry is changing today and how many female drummers are out there today it was really exciting to write the last episode because it's like oh my god like so much has actually changed but without these women paving the way i don't know where we would be today yeah. you know yeah so for example in this orchestra uh the drummer her name was mary mclanahan and she's the world's first female drummer to receive a sponsorship from a large drum drum company, mm. Gretsch, oh, cool. which at the time had reputation of making like the best drum sets yeah. in the jazz world. So, so that's like that's like a major step in the right direction. Also, of a company like Gretsch to say, okay, yeah, let's put you on the front cover here, and you know, let, let let's give you this opportunity. Yeah. So the fact that things started happening like that actually for future generations ended up having a a big impact. Man, one point goes to Gretsch. You know what I mean yeah. for <laughs> being progressive <laughs> yeah. like that. That's so cool. Uh, what? What? Just to kind of tie it all in. What? What year was that? Like, what era are we in right now? Just to check in. Yeah, so we are in the in the nineteen twenties. Okay, still in the twenties. Mid mid nineteen twenties. Yeah, still. That's, yeah, that's awesome. But, but Phil Spitz and his orchestra did go into the thirties as well. Um, but he was not necessarily. <laughs> it was like there was a lot of. Um, restrictions around joining his band and the women had to meet all sorts of requirements that actually had nothing to do with their ability to play yeah uh, so to be in his orchestra you had to be in your 20s you had to have long flowing hair and weigh less than 120 pounds which is 54 kilos yeah and they were not allowed to marry and they needed to ask for permission if they wanted to go on a date <laughs> yeah i was thinking though about having this guy 
uh, running this that yeah. he's probably a bit of a creep. Um, yeah, <laughs> and he he just saw that hey he could and he did earn like great success from that. And and it, it, it's a double edged sword with so many of these scenarios and situations because he did get the you know this orchestra to play to be played heavily on radio, yeah. which then meant that they were exposed to a whole new generation of girls that were listening, thinking, oh, maybe I can do that too, which is a great thing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But at the same time, it was probably quite hard work to actually be one of one of the, the players in his band, you know? Yeah. Just yeah. And knowing this. I don't know. When you look back on history, you see kind of like the the final product, but be, I feel like behind a lot of like famous men and women, there's a lot of just crazy showbiz mm. stuff that happens that's just very mm -hmm. sketchy. Yeah. And and they were also really popular uh, within the army, and uh, they often performed for U.S. servicemen on military bases around the world. And the idea was that soldiers would find the music soothing because it was made entirely by women. Yeah. And this is something that we start to see even more if like in the Second World War, but we're not quite there yet. Mm -hmm. So, so I'll, I'll take that when we get there. Sure. We also saw um, an orchestra called Marian Pankey's Female Orchestra, and it was a pioneering female jazz group made from exclusively uh, from black members, mm, cool. which was even more rare at the time. Yeah. And then there, there was also another uh, all-female orchestra, which, which was called the, the Ingenuous and they were led by Louise Sorensen, and everyone in the band was a uh, multi-instrumentalist, and they earned respect as one of the most versatile groups of their day. And their tour setup included 12 baby grand pianos, <laughs> drums, banjo, accordion, wind, and string instruments. Oh. Okay, you imagine going on tour with that yeah. for not much money at all. How? I mean, like, it's just, uh, it's unfathomable. It's like, how do you do, I mean... Yeah, I, I have that's no like idea. <laughs> semi trucks. I mean, that is eighteen wheelers full. Yeah, <laughs> that's insane. Yeah. And God. back then, you know, we're yeah. in the twenties, yeah. but they did it. Wow, unbelievable. Okay, yeah, good for them. Yeah. That's again, that's very. It, it's it's harder to do what you wanted to do back then for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then we're moving into the thirties, um, and this is really like the swing and and big band era. Uh, and we had the stock market crash in 1929, which then brought on the, the Great Depression. Uh, but although it was like a very difficult time for many, uh, people wanted to just go out and enjoy music and dancing and spend whatever little money they had. Yeah. So although the times were very depressing, the music of the 30s most certainly wasn't. And we have drummers like Viola Smith. Sure. For those of you who don't know who Viola Smith is, uh, she is, she was she was known as America's fastest girl drummer back in, back in 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 the thirties, and uh, she and she was sort of known as the female version of Jean Krupa. And she started playing with her six older sisters, um, and she started to perform in the nineteen twenties when she was ten years old. Mm. <laughs> and she's had an incredible career spanning over six decades, playing in different orchestras like the Coquettes. She also played in Phil Spitalny's all-girl orchestra. The, and they, she's performed several times at the Ed Sullivan Show. And she's also received a scholarship from Juilliard. She's featured in many films. And she's made the cover of Billboard magazine in 1940. Um, and yeah. her reputation as a pioneer amongst drummers is just uh, is undisputed. And uh, she's now featured in the in international Who is Who in music. And uh, she sadly passed away last year in 2020 yeah. at a staggering 107 years of age. Which is just mind-blowing. And this is pretty cool. Yeah. Today uh, is her birthday, November, is it? November 29th. Congre yeah, happy birthday, Viola. <laughs> yeah, so happy birthday to her, um, which is just yeah, I mean, a hundred even drummer or no drummer, living to be a hundred and seven yeah. years old is just oh. unbelievable. Oh, there's a great interview on YouTube with Tom Tom Magazine. Yeah, uh, for anyone who's interested, when I think she's a hundred and two uh, at, at that point when she's doing the interview, it's just fascinating. And another important drummer from this era was Dolly Adams, and she was uh, a drummer and multi instrumentalist who played an important part in the New Orleans scene. Mm. And at age 16, she formed and led her own group. 
Uh, but then a few years later, she got married and uh, her husband said that you basically, that she will have to stop doing the music thing and be a mom instead. So so that's what that's what she ended up doing. But she used her musical skills to train all of her kids to play multiple instruments. <laughs> well, that's great. I mean, that's at least something to keep. It's not like you stop wanting to play, you know? No. Yeah. And this faith was actually really, really common for female musicians back then. And maybe to, to an extent still is today but it's like they they had a early career and then they just gave up that for for their families yeah play at church or become a teacher a uh, music a piano teacher or something like that i would imagine yeah 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 and something that was interesting also around this time and also before this time was that um Female musicians in the 30s actually played an incredibly important role in racial politics, and they have been credited for paving the way for desegregation. Because mm. uh, mixing races in various situations was still prohibited by law in southern parts of the United States. Uh, but several white women preferred the distinct sound of the black all-girl jazz bands and their incredible musicianship. So it wasn't uncommon that white women would disguise themselves as black members to join these bands. And this actually led to several of them spending time in jail. Wow. And, bl and black and white band members would often discuss the absurdity of the fact that one would put on very dark makeup and curl their hair, wh hair whilst the other one would straighten their hair and put on lighter makeup. Mm. So that was like an added addition also to this whole yeah. discussion. It's just like, it's uh it's heavy you know what i mean that like one person wants to be on that side and the other person wants to be on that side and it's just a mm. lot i mean it's such amazing history yeah yeah uh so one african-american all-girl band that was really popular in the 1930s was called the harlem playgirls and uh, it was founded by drummer and band leader sylvester rice and Another uh, group that is very popular from this time is called the International Sweethearts of Rhythm. And they became one of the biggest swing bands in the US. And their drummer, Pauline uh, Brady, was one of the original members of the group. Um, and they also toured in Europe, which inspired bands and drummers in Europe, female drummers, to start playing in Europe, which was great. Um, and as a result, for example, uh, there was a number of female drummers that joined the UK-based Ivy Benson all-female swing band. Mm. So we see this link between the US and the UK inspiring each other already uh, and amongst the women as well. Yeah. You know, I wish there was more video. And I can speak directly about that because I, I always, again, every day I'm looking for these videos for social media for drum history. But like, there's not many videos of... Um, female drummers from like the thirties, whereas there's tons mm. of like, mm. you know, Gene Krupa and Buddy Rich videos, which are all very, uh, you know, even film, like we, like we said earlier, 27, that's when, you know, even sound for picture came out. So it's still pretty early, but there's not that much video yeah. into the forties. I mean, really for a long time, there's not that yeah. much video of these, of these great drummers, um, in these, yeah. these early jazz days. It's so true. And and obviously, because I have videos and pictures along with my series yes. as well. So I've also gone in and tried, yeah, tried exactly. to find, literally like rinsing the internet just to find one picture <laughs> of this drummer that I'm talking about. And sometimes it's impossible. The International Sweethearts of Rhythm, they have quite a few yeah. videos actually um, on YouTube and they are wicked. I so recommend that you go and check them out because the musicianship is just like next level. It's, it's really inspiring. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So let's move on. Let's move into the forties. Um, so, so we have the second world war and now women are taking over men's roles in society. This was happening everywhere. Right. And it was considered a, their patriotic duty. And now some female musicians were asked to fill men's roles in big bands and jazz orchestras. So this actually led to many uh, female musicians going abroad to perform for American soldiers. And uh, one of the bands that was playing when the Japanese attacked in 1941 was Ada Leonard's All-American Girl Orchestra. Mm. Um, wow. And... 
and their drummer was Florence Fagel Liebman. And she 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 just she was a self taught drummer, uh, but she grew up listening to musicians like Duke Ellington, Benny Goodman, Gene Krupa, and, and she was also in New York, so she would go and actually watch them play, and that was her inspiration. Mm. Um, and you can also find some videos of Ada Leonard's All Female Girl Orchestra on on YouTube. That's so neat to to think about that about filling in those because we always think about like. Rosie the Riveter, like grabbing a wrench and you're working on building right. an airplane, but it's like yeah. filling in on big bands and it's yeah. just such a different um, thing that you don't think about. And the scale that's required to be able to fill those seats, yes. you know? Yeah. And in some way it actually worked in 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 their advantage because this was the first time that so many people actually saw women play and see like, oh my God, like they are amazing, but they had just never had those opportunities prior to this. Yeah, and I think it, it obviously probably would have, and I'm guessing, but it would have subliminally kind of people be like, yeah, they're great. We should let them play more. But I, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to jump ahead, but I assume once the, the men came back, it was sort of like, all right, you're done. <laughs> like, Boom. That is exactly what happened. Yeah. And I'm just going to uh, read a little snippet from an article that Viola Smith um, wrote. Uh, just when when the when the war was ending and it was called girl give girl musicians a, a break mm, cool. um i don't actually have the the exact quotes here but the idea behind the article was that there was so many prejudice against female musicians um so so she was just saying that can't can't female musicians actually get a chance to stay and do this professionally just because now you've seen that we're clearly capable of doing it. So just let us stay on the scene. Yeah. Because like you said, exactly what happened afterwards was that now women need to 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 go back home and stay in the kitchens. And it was that was actually reinforced even more so than prior to the war. Yeah. Jeez. I mean, it's just so terrible. And I think everyone knows that, but I, I'm assuming it was sort of a it's threatening to like the status quo to like have things change mm -hmm. uh, outside of like wartime where it has to happen. But when everything's back, it's just that I'm sure a lot of the, the, yeah. the men then, and I mean, speaking as a man, I mean, it's kind of, I can only guess, but it's like, yeah, I I'm sure they were threatened. They were like, no, 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 we'll, we'll handle this. You go, you can't be better than me. I'm the guy you have yeah. to, I have to be better, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and then, um, just someone I think is worth like mentioning from the 40s uh, is Willie Mae Big Mama Thornton, who was the first known uh, uh, blues singer to combine her vocal and songwriting talent with her drumming skills. So she was also playing drums um, and she grew up singing in church and she taught herself to play harmonica and drums, uh, which would become a regular part of her on stage performance. And Peacock Records saw her talent and signed her in 1941. And she would then actively perform on the on the Chitlin circuit, which was considered a circuit that was safe for African Americans to perform in the days of segregation. Sure. Um, and then in 1953, she recorded a song that you might have heard of called Hound Dog, which went straight to number one in the R&B charts. And even though it sold more than two million copies, She's only ever received 500 US dollars for this. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> and then we have Elvis who released his version just a few years later. And not only would he, you know, receive incredible fame, but also a fortune from the same record. So here is what we talked about earlier. Here's a prime example of that. Yeah. Man, um, that is such a, a sign of the times. Mm hmm. And there was another singing drummer as well. Her name is Johnny Mae Dunson. And she would come, become like a Chicago blues uh, legend. And she started performing on Maxwell Street, which is the celebrated birthplace of Chicago blues. And, um, and in an article in, in the Chicago Tribune, in an interview she did, she said, when I first started playing in Chicago in the 1940s, people said ugly things about women who plays the blues. They said, she must not be a woman if she plays the drums, and they would call her names and so on. Hmm. So, so there's just a little insight of, of like some of the challenges that they would have, and, but still go on and do it. 
and she's uh, she's actually written over six six hundred blues tunes wow. in her over sixty year long career, and she also wrote songs for artists like Muddy Waters and Jim Reed. But she again never got paid more than fifty dollars, and often nothing at all for these songs. Wow! Uh, but she continued to drum and sing the blues until her death in two thousand seven. Wow, man, that's a long, uh, long life of just grinding and and doing it. And there's such a it's it's interesting because there's always I mean historically there's like a thing about drummers like getting paid less than other members, which is like mm. proven going way back. But like mm. add on top of that being a, a woman in the 1940s add on top of that being a black woman it's just like Mm -hmm. man then to go all the way up to 2007 it's just unbelievable yeah Yeah. so do check her out johnny may dunson there's some some cool stuff on youtube as well cool okay so then we're moving into the 50s and uh and this was an era when a new generation teeny boppers got their own identity and we saw rockabilly music and rock and roll that would change the face of of music forever and uh and so again with this new style of music we see many female musicians struggle to find their place in the rock and roll world um because it was also something that was considered very a very masculine thing and even the the early musicians and artists that tried which i will just i will cover some of them sure. um they they were people just really looked down on them because they didn't want to see women six, uh, sing about like freedom and sexuality and all these things which like this this topics that were associated with rock and roll didn't fit for a woman yeah. to to perform so to say yeah so in the early 50s a lot of female musicians had lost their jobs and the su- success of all female orchestras in the 30s and 40s was now heavily declining and the general opinion according to music trade magazines was that female bands were unable to compete with their male counterparts hmm. i mean and also times changed too where uh male orchestras and big bands were kind of becoming outdated a little bit um not i mean they obviously still happened through the 50s but you know what i mean where things were changing in general so for the all female orchestras i'm sure it was like boy we better start uh better start to pivot here a little bit Mm -hmm. and there was uh there's three drummers that i want to mention from this decade uh kate carlson is one um, and she received um, a drum endorsement from from Ludwig, and uh, uh, and and she actually went against the trend of the time, and she ended up forming her own nineteen piece big band, and and they did quite well, mm. uh, which was quite rare at the time uh, because of it. it. They were an all female band, and they were also doing a big band, which was kind of out at the time. But they did a lot of like TV shows, yeah. like like the Spade Cooley show and stuff like that. Cool. Um, and Remo Drum Company gave Kay Carlson the Excellence in the Professional Percussion Instruction Award in 1989. Wow. And Los Angeles Times also recognized her for a remarkable trailblazing career that helped open doors for female musicians everywhere. Awesome. So that's well cool. Well deserved. Yes. And then we have uh, Dottie Dodgian, uh, who still lives in California. And uh, she's another groundbreaking drummer from this era who was an innovator and very versatile in her playing. And as a teenager, she played with Charles Mingus and later on with Benny Goodman and the Brecker Brothers. And she helped to establish many other bands. And in her early years, she was famous for her elegant brushwork. And she had an active career throughout her whole life, pretty much until now. Uh, And she released her own vocal album in 1996 at the age of 77. Wow. Wow. Man, passion, yeah. passionate people. Yeah. <laughs> and then we have uh, Shelag Pearson on this side of the pond. So she's a UK drummer and she was voted the best girl drummer in the UK in 1954's Melody Maker Paul. Wow. And she played with Ivy Benson, Lena Kid Corted, and the Dina D. All Girls in the 50s. And she continued her career until 2004 when she retired in south of. Uh, England after playing with the Sidmouth Town Band as a percussionist. Awesome. Cool. Good to represent uh, the UK there a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And um, 
And then someone that I hadn't heard of before, she's not a drummer, but she's super cool. Uh, she's a rockabilly singer and songwriter, and her name is Sparkle Moore. And she's sometimes referred to as the female Elvis Presley. And she's had a really like remarkable long career. And in 2010, she was inducted into the Iowa Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And the same year, she also released Spark a Billy, a 22 song collection she wrote and self recorded. So she's also someone who's had a career since the 50s wow. and still going. That's awesome. Just looking up pictures of her, she, yeah. that is like. <laughs> the rockabilly look. I mean, good for her. I know. She's so cool. And really cool songs as well. Check her out. So moving into the 60s. All right. Uh, we had soul, Motown. We had rock with different subgenres. So music was definitely developing, changing. We started to see more and more subgenres, more and more branches from the tree getting diverse, right? And um, especially with, with Motown, we had Diana Ross and the Supremes, which was one of the most influential groups to come out of Motown. Um, and then we also had bands like the Marvelettes, Mar Martha and the Vandellas, the Ronettes, Aretha Franklin, Nina Simone, Dusty Springfield. So we started to see a lot more women in general on the scene. Yeah. I mean, the 60s, I think the world, everything just kind of uh from looking at you know historical stuff it just seems different it's just a yeah. like a seismic change um of yeah. everything not to say it got better for everyone uh overnight but but i don't know you still there's still some you you see videos and you hear about female drummers but it's definitely still a, a male driven world at that point obviously oh yeah 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 but there were a few that I'm going to mention totally. now <laughs> and probably a lot more that I'm not mentioning yep. but a lot more that Maybe that I, I don't even know about, you know, that were there. Uh, but we had the British invasion, obviously, also in 1963. And um, so I just want to talk about a few uh, like UK drummers, more UK drummers. So there was a band called the Honeycombs, which was an English beat pop group formed in 1963. And the group's most distinguishing mark was their female drummer, Honey Lantry. And the band's name came from a combination of Lantry's nickname and her job as a hairdresser. Mm. Um, and she was a, both a great drummer and vocalist. And they had chart topper called Have I the Right? And the drums carry an important part of the song uh, and and the effect of the drums was enhanced by members in the band stamping their feet on wooden chairs in the studio. So you, this is also a video that you can find on YouTube, sure. for example. Cool. It looks like she's playing Carlton uh, drums, which is, you know, very British. Yeah. And we had other um, UK drummers like uh, London native Tina Amos of the British pop group The Ravens. Um she was 16 when she joined the band and their most famous song was I Just Want to Hear You Say I Love You. And then we also had Sylvia Sanders from The Liverbirds, which was a band from Liverpool that reached huge, huge success in Germany. Mm. And then there was also a band called The Mission Bells who had two drummers, Lorraine Hall and Laurie Brown. And then one drummer who is still a powerhouse today is Chrissy Lee. And she's still actively drumming and teaching in the UK today. Man, that's awesome. And she's been, yeah, I know. And she's been practically drumming her whole life. She joined the Salvation Army Band at age four. And uh, she's played with some of the music industry's most celebrated artists. And in 1963, her and her, her band, the Beat Chicks, supported the Beatles on their first tour in Spain. Hmm. Wow. And it, yeah, I know. It's amazing. I, I did an interview actually with her, uh, a, few, a couple of months ago and it was just so interesting to hear all of her adventures yeah. and everything she's done in such like long incredible career that she's had oh, sure. and only last year in 2020 she joined britain's got talent with a jaw-dropping audition that aired on national television <laughs> wow yeah that's so cool and it's neat again for me to hear about all these great female drummers that like geographically not even because they're female drummers but it's just there's like it's hard to find people in other um continents that you might not uh know about so that's great info yeah 
And then we also had a band called Goldie and the Gingerbread. So it was the first all-female pop band that was signed to a major record label. And the drummer in the band was Ginger Bianco. Um, and she ran away from home at age 17 to pursue a career in music. And then she met Goldie at the Trudy Heller's Club in New York. And the rest is, is history. Hmm. Um, but most female bands were ignored by big record labels at the time. And we, many women hadn't ventured into the world of rock because of the heavily masculine connotation to the style, like I said before. So Goldie and the Gingerbreads were amongst the first to break into a domain that was really dominated by men. And they were signed to Decca in 1963 and then to Atlantic in 64. So they are definitely someone to check out as well. Pit pioneers for sure. Yeah, it just takes and, one or two to break through to make it like normal, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because... You know the saying, you can't be what you can't see. Exactly. You know, th th there's so much that goes into that. So so we had the second band to receive a major record record deal was the Pleasure Seekers, an all-female rock band from Detroit, Michigan. And the original lineup included a lead singer, Susie Quattro and Patty Quattro with Nancy Ball on drums. Um, and they became one of the earliest all-female rock bands to sign with, with uh, a major label. Uh, and they had... Uh, two singles that charted lights of love and good kind of hurt hmm. wow good for them it's yeah extremely uh it's it's so cool to hear about what's happening in the world at that time i'm sure people still were kind of like the men i'm sure they were treated not great like backstage or just showing up places mm. they're still kind of looked down upon mm -hmm. i'm sure yeah this episode is brought to you by dream symbols and their awesome new symbol bag it is a heavy-duty, strong, durable cymbal bag made for professionals with a nice tread on the bottom, and it's reinforced everywhere that it needs to be. Uh, you have three compartments on it, two in the main pocket area, and then one separate compartment on the outside of the bag. It has padded shoulder straps and a nice handle, or you can wear it with a single strap kind of across your body. It fits sizes up to a 24-inch ride, which is really huge, um, and then you can just walk around having the confidence that your symbols are safe in this awesome bag from Dream Symbols. Check it out at dreamsymbols.com or on social media at Dream Symbols. And then one drummer that we can't leave out is Mo Tucker. So Mo Tucker is the drummer from Velvet Underground, another epic rock band formed in New York City in 1964, for those of you who don't know, and they were managed by Andy Warhol. And she was asked to join the band in 65. And it was actually her unconventional style, uh, like playing style that came to define the sound of the band, keeping the music rooted in traditional rock rhythms uh, while other members would lay abstract lyric lyrical images and feedback and other sound textures on top of that. But it was like her, her drumming where she rarely actually used symbols that just kept it very clean and it created their quite unique sound yeah um and, sh and she claimed that the purpose of a drummer is simply to keep time and that symbols were an un unnecessary for for this and it would then they would just drown out the other instruments i mean that's a good point and it's it's i've there's bands who do that and it does sound different it just kind of gives mm -hmm. it a clarity to it and um that's interesting that she gave it that much thought and uh a very iconic drummer for sure yeah yeah, some say that her greatest contribution was inspiring the idea of women as instrumentalists into the collective rock and roll consciousness. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Which is true, totally. you know? Yeah, you, like you said, you got to see it. Someone else can do it to have yeah. the confidence to then go out and try and do it themselves. So, um, but again, you have to have that, that self-starting person to, uh, <laughs> to do it first. Yeah, and you have to have a band that gets as prolific as yeah. the Velvet Underground. That, yeah. So you get that major exposure. It's a lot of aligning of the stars correctly to make it work. I'm sure there's countless drummers that we probably have never heard of who are women who just, it didn't line up for them. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And male, obviously, as well. That's, oh, yeah. That is for just sure. the history, you know. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So moving on, <laughs> I want to cram, try to cram as much as possible sure. into <laughs> into this because now it's starting to get just even more and more fun, yeah. and more and more bands are coming onto the scene. And and the seventies, um, we had a band called Fanny. Yeah. 
And Fanny were the, the first all-female rock band who received a full album deal under a major record label. So, so the, the, the ones I've mentioned in the last decade, the, it was just singles for them. And they had, and Fanny had commercial success, including two top 40 hits on the Billboard Hot 100 charts. And they also worked as session musicians for artists like Barbara Streisand. And, um, and Alice DeBurr was the drummer in the band. Um, and she, I'll just have a quote here from her when she says that she doesn't think attitudes towards drummers of her gender have changed much over the years. Mm. And for the past decade, she has kept the Fanny name alive via the Fanny Rocks website. So that's a great place to go and check out like archive footage and old music from from Fanny. Yeah, there's some really cool. There's the iconic video of Fanny where it's like they're on like the blue background, yeah. um, which I think most people have seen if they're familiar with that band. But um, yeah, good for her keeping it alive. Yeah, yeah, it's great. And there was another band called Bertha. Who were, who were also ahead of their time. Uh, and they formed in Los Angeles. And Olivia Liver Fav- Favela was the drummer and singer. And each of the band members contributed with lead vocals and harmonies. And most of the band's songs were composed by members of the group. And they signed a record deal with Daniel Records in 72 and released their debut self-titled al- album later that year. And they toured for more than t- 250 days per year performing with acts like Fleetwood Mac, Alice Cooper, B.B. King, and Liver's drumming is compared to Thor <laughs> wielding his hammer and female newsletter called her, without the doubt, the wildest singing drummer of all time. Wow. <laughs> and she is amazing. There's quite a few videos actually on YouTube of Bertha and she's like, just imagine Janis Joplin behind the kit. Mm. You know, awesome. I've never heard of them. I've got a lot to look into after this. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So despite critical praise, this is probably why you've never heard of them. Uh, Bertha never quite made it. And some critics say that the success never came because men didn't really want to hear rock chicks sing about freedom and sexuality. Hmm. And they even uh, they printed out these like T-shirts that said Bertha has balls. (laughs) But. That people just didn't want to see girls with balls, you know, <laughs> like at the time. Yeah, they're not ready for that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then we also had um, a comic book, which actually sort of helped to inspire more girls to pick up drums. They were called, it was called Josie and the Pussycats. Sure. And it was a comic book for teenagers. Maybe you know about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's about a fictional all-girl rock band. Um, and this became like a Saturday morning cartoon by Hanna-Barbera in the 1970s and then made into a feature movie in 2001. And then another band that we have to mention uh, from the 70s is, is The Runaways. Mm-hmm. It's the first teenage all-girl hard rock band to record and achieve international success. And they are considered to be the pioneers of girl power, really. Yeah. And they uh, released their debut album in 1976. And uh, first, when it came out in the US, uh, some critics dismissed the band. Uh, but outside of US, they became superstars, and especially in Japan. And Sandy West was the drummer uh, and one of the founding members of the band together with Joe and Jet. And uh, so Time Magazine, for example, has described Sandy as the greatest female drummer in the history of rock and roll. Mm. Wow, that's quite the honor. I mean, they, yeah, the Runaways are massive and they have almost this kind of like, we don't, I mean, I think it's their whole thing, but it's like, we don't care what you think. We are, they seem like the real deal uh, yeah. rock and rollers, you know? Yeah. And it's, I, I, I've read, um, the autobiography by the singer Cherie Curie, it's called Neon Angel. And oh my gosh, what those girls went through with yeah. their manager. Like, he was crazy. Jeez. And they were very young. Yeah. And yeah. it definitely messed with them oh, I a can, lot. I couldn't imagine. I mean, being, um, that seems like showbiz in general, a little mm-hmm, bit. It is. Creepy yeah. older men and like, uh, yeah. <laughs> It, they're I mean they're attractive younger women who are very talented and very popular and it's like that's a recipe for um possible problems yeah so it's uh I could definitely re- recommend but and there's a movie also called the Runaways which I actually think is is really good I think that came out maybe 2012 or something yeah like I that. didn't see that I is it you think it's worth watching I think so yeah cool. I really like it I'll check it out yeah, I think it's really well done nice um and then we also had a 
funk and disco and punk, you know, there was so much musically that was happening in the 70s, right? It's just becoming like more and more diverse, more and more to cram in to to one episode, I realized when I was right. <laughs> You're doing good. Yeah, we're getting the highlights, you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but someone that we absolutely have to mention uh, when it co- in, inside of the funk umbrella is Shaka Khan. She's the queen of funk. Yeah. And she's actually a really great drummer. And a lot of people don't know this, but she is. And there's some cool clips of her drumming online as well. There are. Yeah, she's uh, like, no joke, a very good drummer. Um, yeah like can hold it down we're not like a little not like i'm gonna sit down every once in a while and kind of dabble like she is a she is a drummer for sure yeah and it's and especially when it comes to funk yeah you know she's got the groove and that's what's needed with funk totally she's amazing um yeah and then we had disco that saw its rise and its fall all within the same decade although it still has a large a super big influence today on the music and fashion and everything yeah. that that we have today and then um, and then punk is quite quite interesting actually when it comes to women and making music because of the whole ethos behind punk the whole diy you know let's do it ourselves and it's anti so many things anyway so the, it, it sort of there was a, a platform for women to be a part of the punk scene and especially in uh, so the, so the punk sort of started in in New York uh, with artists like Patti Smith, and then soon after there was a scene that developed in London, which became very very strong here. Um, yeah, man, you're so right about um, it. Just fits in perfectly with being you know kind of oppressed and like being angry. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. like you, mm-hmm. the perfect. Uh, it, it lines up perfectly, and you know, I'm. There's a lot of great female punk drummers too, which which can be very physically demanding music. You know what I mean? Yeah. To play fast, yeah. so you got to have your chops up to to play that stuff. Totally, totally. And it, and it, and one drummer from the 70s. Uh, her name is Paul Molive, and she was the drummer and founder of the all female punk band The Slits together with Viv Albertine and Ari Up. And she was originally from Spain, and she moved to London. Uh, at 18 and she just became a part of the London punk scene and the slits played gigs with the clash the sex pistols and they were described as dangerous mm-hmm. when when they came notorious for their fights on stage and for provoking their audiences that's awesome <laughs> yeah yeah and after the slits she joined another all-female punk band called the raincoats and she continued to have fans like kurt cobain and Courtney love and sonic youth that's awesome People, people yeah. who respect uh, good musicians. Yeah. And we also had other female artists within the punk scene, like Susie Quattro, Susie Sue, Nina Hagen, Exine, Servanka, Polystyrene, Poison Ivy, Lydia Lunch, Gay Black. So they were some some women that's worth checking out mm. from, from the early punk scene. Cool. And then we also had um, a record label called Olivia Records, which was the first female-owned record la- record label founded in 1973 uh, by a group of women to promote music made by women. That's cool. And we also, yeah, yeah. And we also had Rosetta Records, which was founded by a woman named Rosetta Rice. And she searched for and produced albums of the early women of jazz and blues to ensure that royalties were paid to the artists. So she actually went back in time and tried to like honor and help the the women from the twenties, the thirties, the forties. Mm, that's with awesome. her label to use your power, for lack of a better term, to like you know you can start a label. Let's represent people who didn't get the opportunity that they had, you know, or had less of an opportunity. Mm-hmm. It's great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And then someone that we can't leave out is. Karen Carpenter. Yes. Unbelievable. Absolute. Drummer. Yeah. Absolute musical legend. Uh, she's described by modern drummer um, as a drummer in full command of her technique, assured and full of fire, playing imaginative fails and great hand foot combinations. Yeah. Yeah. She's, which, is, which is true. I love watching videos of her drumming. Yeah. There's, so many good ones. Yeah, I mean, she's just like you can tell, classically trained all around. Though, just like yeah. an amazing musician with a great voice. Um, 
who obviously kind of had a tragic end to her life, but was just phenomenal as, and, and that, you know, that's like a lot of little kids are probably more, uh, inclined to watch Karen Carpenter play the drums than maybe like a hardcore punk female drummer. Yeah. You know, just cause like it's on TV and it's stuff like that. Yeah. So that really represents female drummers to the younger generation. Yeah. And and I think a huge part of her sad ending to her life is, is the fact that the band had huge success and she was literally pulled away from the drums to take center stage yeah. as a lead singer, which she never really wanted to do because her first love was was drumming. Yeah. You know? Very true. Okay, so let's move on to the 1980s. So here we have MTV changing the face of music yeah, forever. For sure. You know? We had bands like The Bangles, which is one of the biggest uh, 80s all-female bands that MTV helped to launch. The drummer is Debbie Peterson, and she's also performed with artists like Bonnie Raitt, Katie Lang, Emily Harris, and uh, Spinal Tap, actually. <laughs> and, and then we also have uh, The Go-Go's, which is one of the most commercially successful all-female bands in history. Yeah. And they are actually the only all-female band ever who has written, played, and produced their own records, uh, rather than being controlled by typical male producers and managers. Wow. And their album Beauty and the Beat hit the Billboard charts and is considered one of the cornerstone albums of, of new wave music. Wow. And Gina Shock is the drummer in the band. And she had a huge influence on, on, the, ho on the whole success of the Go-Go's. And in recent years, she's also written songs for Miley Cyrus and Selena Gomez. That's cool. And, and I think this year, 2021, I'm pretty sure they were just inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, I think. Oh, amazing. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, and then we also have a band called Climax. Um, and, uh, and they are a self-produced all-female R&B uh, and pop band where every member in the band play an instrument. And uh, their, uh, their debut album came out, came out in 1981 and it's called Never Underestimate the Power of a Woman. And they had several chart hits, including a top five billboard single, I Miss You. And their drummer is called Bernadette Cooper. Um, and she started the band and she's also done her own diva and a turntable tour after this and and also written a solo album. Mm. And you can clearly hear the impact of electronic drums in their sound. They have some real fun videos online. And this is, you know, when, when the big drum machines, yeah, sure. you know, when we have gated reverb, electronic drums are really taking over. And uh, it, yeah, the, and, and because she was the person who founded the band, the drums have quite a prominent feature, which is great. Of course, yeah, they should. Man, I mean, the 80s, yeah. it seems to me like the 80s are more progressive. I mean, it seems like it's 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 becoming more commonplace and less jarring that there's women playing music than, let's say, mm -hmm. the 1930s. Is that fair to say? Oh, gosh, yes, yeah. totally, 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 yeah. And then we had amazing people like Sylvia Robinson, who uh, is considered the mother of hip hop. She was the founder and CEO of the hip hop label Sugar Hill Records, which released the song Rapper's Delight, yeah. which was the first commercial successful hip hop song and revolutionized the, the industry. Uh, so she's uh, uh, obviously an important person within all of that than saying, I mean, hip hop is still so dominating oh, yeah. today. Yeah. And, and, and she also signed acts, uh, all female acts, uh, and one of them was called The Sequence, and they were featuring a teenage Angie Stone. Oh, cool. And they had a million selling hit with Funk You Up. Amazing. Yeah. And then we also had uh, drummers like Kate Schellenbach, and she was playing with uh, Beastie Boys from 1981 to 1984. Yeah, there's a yeah. video of that somewhere floating yeah. around which um i mean they, they're so young <laughs> that, uh-huh yeah so this was before they really pop yeah so she's she's on recordings like polly wogs 2 and kooky puss hmm. but then when they popped and there's this whole interview with her where she's sort of talking about like how it was quite disappointing that one day she was just not in the band anymore you know yeah, and then they, that... they suddenly like took off yeah, yeah, kind of on topic for what we're talking about, you know? I mean, that's yeah. not good, but I guess it happens yeah. still. But well, after she left the Be Beastie Boys, she um, she joined a band called Lucius Jackson that she actually helped to form mm -hmm. as well. Cool. 
And then we also have metal in the 80s. And uh, female musicians often still had the reputation of cute chicks playing music. So in response, some women formed all-female metal bands. Um, and one one band that was more like a hard rock band, uh, but but that was Heart, that is worth mentioning, because they had Sister Anne and Nancy Wilson. Um, and then we also have uh, all, all female heavy metal bands like Girls School from South, South London. And the original member of the band, Kathy Valentine, left to join the Go-Go's. Um, and they had like early recordings with together with Motorhead and stuff That's like that. That's awesome. Yeah. And then we also had Roxy Petrucci, who is uh, the drummer in the all-female glam metal bands, Madame X and Vixen. Hmm. So she, that is, there's quite a, quite a lot of footage online of them. And, and she's, super, she's wicked as well. She's great to... to to check out and Madam X became known for the visually stunning live shows described as a brilliant blend of Rocky horror picture show with spinal tap moments. <laughs> that's awesome. That's a, that's what you want. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. And another metal drummer was Carol control Duckworth who played for the all female bands, precious metal and bombshell. Hmm. Which are also worth mentioning. And then we have uh, Bobby Hall who is an American percussionist uh, who has performed on records like Ain't No Sunshine by Bill Withers, Let, uh, Let's Get It On by Marvin Gaye, Edge of Seventeen by Stevie Nicks, and many more. And as a young percussionist, she was discovered by Motown and found herself recording with artists like The Temptations and Diana Ross and Supremes. And she's also played with artists like Bob Dylan, Carole King, Janis Joplin, Johnny Mitchell, wow. Aretha Franklin, The Doors, Pink Floyd, James Taylor, and the list just goes on and on on Jeez. Bobby Hall. Check her out. Wow. So cool. I mean, I feel like I am like frantically Googling on my phone while we're talking because it's <laughs> like, and I hope people are doing the same where they yeah. can kind of like make a list of Making all notes. these amazing yeah. drummers to check out because it's, yeah. um, it's worth it. It's worth it. And it's hard to find. This is firsthand. Like we're getting the scoop here from Vicky. It's like, you can't really find this info anywhere else. So this is, this is just great. <laughs> And you can go back though, and because all of this will obviously be in the Drumming Through the Decade yes, series. Absolutely. So if there's any names, or if you don't have pen and paper now listening to this interview, just go and check out Drumming Through the Decades on YouTube yeah. and find the decade that you're interested in. And all of these yeah. people will be listed there with videos and pictures as well. Totally. Everyone should check that out. Yeah. Okay. So chugging forward here. Yes. So then we also have Jody Lynn Scott who is definitely worth men mentioning because she's worked as a recording artist and live percussionist with so many well-known musicians. It's hard to keep track. Uh, so, and they include Stevie Wonder, Eric Clapton, Patti LaBelle, JC, and Avril Lavigne. Um, and then she's also appeared in numerous films and live concert videos, including uh, Elton John's Live in Australia and The Who's Live at Giant Stadium. Oh, wow. Man. Yeah. The session musician world is like... You don't think of um, that many female session musicians, but it's mm -hmm. like, I guess that's just be even male session musicians. You're not really supposed to know that much about them. They're kind of like in the background. Um, mm. You know, it's it's kind of cool to know how many women are uh, are 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 doing it on their own, you know, making that living, yeah. which it's hard for anyone to thrive exactly. as a session musician. And today there there's loads of them. Yeah. I, I know a lot of them personally, which is which is very inspiring. So it's great to see that that is really that that's really changed. You know, I feel like so much has changed today, actually, thanks to all of these people that I'm bringing up now. Totally. You know? And then one person that we definitely just have to mention is Sheila E. Oh, yeah. She is one of my biggest inspirations. Yeah. Unbelievable. And, and she began she began her career playing with uh, George Duke with the George Duke band. And since then, she's played with, I mean, I, I don't know how you can even sum up her career, yeah. but Prince, Santana, Ringo Starr, and so many more legends. And he's obviously a, a great artist in her own right with the 80s classic, The Glamorous Life. And she's just, she's known as the queen of percussion. Yeah. And, and what the work that she's still doing today um, is incredible. I just saw a video a few days ago uh, on her YouTube channel called Little Drummer Girls, where it's her and then it's Sarah Thor, uh, who is an amazing yep, she's drummer. Great. She's doing lots of stuff with Drumio right now. And then there's also two kids, 
uh, is Geneva London, yep. who is a, a young drummer from London, and then Sheeta. And they are doing a cover, the four of them together. And it's just badass. That's it's awesome. so good. She is like, I mean, it's almost that Buddy Rich level of like a household name. I mean, which is hard to achieve for anyone, but it's just like she just pushed everything forward. She was like a, a monumental shift in like, oh, I can do that. And I mean, yeah. especially as like a Hispanic woman, it's just like, mm -hmm. it's just even that much more special and come yeah. and play with Prince. I mean, which most people kind of think of that era and like drum solos and high heels. It's just like, oh. <laughs> it's madness. Oh, I know. <laughs> okay. So let's, I, I could talk about Sheila forever. <laughs> yeah. Let's move on yeah. because there's so many more sure. uh, people that I still want to mention. And I know that this is getting long now uh okay so um let's move into the 90s and uh and let's just start off by noting that the 90s was truly the decade of the female mm -hmm. where women had careers that affirmed their independence and they were confident in their own skin and in what they could accomplish and in music we started to see women everywhere we had everything from spice girls madonna mariah carey dominating the pop charts to garbage no doubt Ellen is morissette killing it on the rock side and it hasn't been a better musical decade for women really and we also saw bands such as hole l7 and bikini kill that demonstrating on stage and in interviews a self-confident and bad attitude yeah so-called bad to challenge assumptions about how an all-female band should behave and how girls should behave so we had uh, drummers like Patti Chamel who played drums in hole uh, which was founded and fronted by Courtney Love um and then we also have uh, drummers like D Placas, who was a, the drummer in the American grunge band L7. They achieved major success in the 90s and actually reformed again in 2014. And the band has been described as one of the one of rock's most volatile and respected acts with a sound that is unique and unforgiving. Yeah. So yeah. So and they and they. Um, the actual the name L7 comes from a slang term for square and was deliberately chosen as a gender neutral sign. And in 1991, they they formed a pro choice women's rights group called Rock for Choice, which for a decade held concerts. So they were essentially like concert promoters. Yeah. And they were featuring artists like Nirvana, Red Hot Chili Peppers, The Bangles, Rage Against the Machine. And there is a documentary about the band L7, which is called Pretend We're Dead, that premiered in 2016. Cool. Yeah, they're they're huge. I mean, they're iconic. Yeah. And then we have uh, Four Non Blondes with Don Richardson on drums. Um, and their album, Bigger, Better, Faster, More, spent 59 weeks on the Billboard charts. And their album's second single, What's Up, became a massive radio and MTV hit, receiving gold and platinum record sales. Then we have the Riot Girl movement, which is an underground feminist punk movement that played a key role in changing the musical landscape of the 90s by introducing women's perspectives on frustration, depression, and anger. And we have bands like Bikini Kill, Bratmobile, L7 is also a part of this, and Huggy Bear. Uh, and they are associated... Uh, with the movement addressing in their music issues such as rape, domestic abuse, sexuality, racism, patriar patriarchy, and female empowerment. Um, and this movement started in Olympia, Washington, with young women who created gar garage bands and homemade magazines, so-called zines, uh, that covered a range of political and feminist topics. And Riot Girl blasted feminism into the future, centering the needs of a new generation by exchanging manifestos and promoting a do-it-yourself culture. And music was the vehicle for for this. Hmm. That's so cool. It's and it's Riot G R R R L, right? Like that's, Riot Girl. Yes. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. That's um. Again, it takes a lot of guts to to stick out like that, but it almost feels like with that kind of like music. A lot of frustration, a lot of like, we're angry mm -hmm. from all this stuff that's been happening and now we're going to do this on our own. Yeah. And we can again, see how punk really sort of created that vehicle and gave space Definitely. for that. Yeah. And, and by the mid twenties, uh, the riot girl movement was receiving constant uh, attention and misrepresentation misrepresent by media, which eventually actually kind of killed the whole movement. But 
the seeds were sown for a long lasting impact. And then in the early 2000s, uh, that inspired uh, the international girls rock camps that now inspire girls and other gender minorities to rock all over the world. And that movement is just growing and growing. That's awesome. I didn't know anything about that. Um, the rock camps and stuff like that. That's even more. Yeah, it's called Girls Rock. Girls Rock Camp Alliance is the international body. And there is hundreds of camps all over the world, literally, um, that that create music camps uh, for girls, trans and non-binary youth and adults as well. And I've been a part of uh, of starting up Girls Rock London in the UK and Rock Donna in Finland. Uh, and the idea behind these camps is that you you don't need to have any previous musical experience. You can do, but you don't need to. Mm -hmm. You come to our camps, you learn to play an instrument, uh, you form a band, you write, a you, you write a, an original song with that band, and you then perform it at a final showcase six days later. Wow, that's awesome. And that is mixed like just with a lot of other interesting programming throughout that week. And it's all about creating a safe space for for vulnerable young people to come and express themselves um, and and give them a chance to do that in a context where they might never have been able to do that before. That's so cool. What a good cause. I'm sure people listening right now are uh, either female or have daughters or, or that applies to them um, so they can um, check it out. Absolutely. Because yeah, that's such a cool. Definitely. Yeah. Check out Girl, Girls Rock Camp Alliance and on that website, uh, all the membership camps all over the world are listed. So then you can see if there's a camp anywhere near you. Hmm. So cool. And I'll share the link in the description uh, so people can find the main website and go from there. Great. Cool. Great. Uh, so another band uh, that is worth mentioning from this era is the Donnas. Yeah. They were another pop punk band from California formed in 93. And Tori Castellano is the original drummer and she was later replaced by, by Amy uh, Kisari. And then we also have Cindy Blackman Santana. Yeah. And she she's both known as a jazz drummer with her own band. Um, that's that's how she sort of started off. But then she became a rock chick in the 90s when she teamed up with Lenny Kravitz. And she stayed with Kravitz for 11 years touring the world, which also gave her the opportunity to perform with people such as James Brown, Prince, Mick Jagger, Iggy Pop. And today she's best known for her work with her husband, Carlos Santana, who she met while she was on tour with Kravitz. And uh, she has established a reputation as an innovator who's always experimenting and pushing creative boundaries. And she's incredible. Yeah, she's a monster drummer. And she has some great sections in the new Count Me In documentary on Netflix. Yes. Um, that is she does. awesome. So, yeah, very yeah, good player. That documentary is very inspiring. Yeah, very well done. Yeah. Okay, so three other drummers that I want to mention from the from 90s is Deborah Dobkin. She's a percussionist who can be heard on numerous recordings and live concerts with artists like Bonnie Raitt, Elton John, Melissa Etheridge, Don Henley, and Cher. Um, and then we also have Linda McDonald, and she was the drummer and co-founder of the all-female heavy metal band Phantom Blue. Um, and, and the band got signed for their incredible musicianship and Linda was given much credit for the band's energy style and sound. And she's considered one of the best drummers of the 1990s. And in 97, she won the best drummer performance and drums award at the LA music awards. Mm, cool. And then we also have Juanita para Corea. And Juanita para Corea is the drummer in Los Jaivas from Chile, who are considered one of Latin America's most influential bands of all time. And Juanita's dad, Gabriel Para, was the original drummer in the band, who sadly passed away in a car crash. Mm. And Juanita started playing the drums at age three, and then she took over the drum throne after her dad. And she's the only woman who has played in the band over its 60-year history. Wow. And she's known for her distinctive style, mixing Latin and progressive rock. Awesome. Now we've hit the 2000s. A lot of things changed, you know, yeah. with the launch of YouTube, music sharing sites like iTunes, uh, DIY promotion sites like My MySpace, and the rise of TV talent shows like X Factor. You know, like the music industry just had to remodel yes. like never before. Yeah. Yeah. Gender, um, un like, uh, it's like unbiased gender wise at that point. It's like everyone's got to change. The entire industry is, is upside down. Yeah. 
Yeah, so true. And obviously pop was was huge, you know, Madonna, Pink, Shakira, Lady Gaga, the list goes on. Um, I just want to list a few pop drummers, female pop drummers. So we have Shawnee Wreck, uh, who is most known as Shawnee Baby, and she is considered one of the top female drummers, uh, supporting some of the decades chart-topping pop artists like the Pussycat Dolls, Nicole Scherzinger, and Hilary Duff. She started her career by setting up an all-female band in school called Pleasure, and they toured with artists like Salt and Pepper and Queen Latifah. And she has written a book called The Female Musician's Guide to Surviving on the Road, mm. which is worth checking out. Totally, yeah. And then we have Beyonce, uh, who did her first ever world tour, the Beyonce Experience, uh, where she put together an all-female band that she dubbed uh, that she named the Sugar Mamas. And she hand selected 10 female musicians at the top of their game, uh, which included bass player Divinity Rocks. And some of the uh, the drummers that she had, who are just insane and amazing, are Kim Thompson, Nikki Glaspie, and Marcy Chapa. And then we also have Tori Castellano, who is the drummer in the pop punk band The Donnas, mm-hmm. which I already mentioned earlier. Yeah, actually. which I'm like, I didn't know the Donnas formed in 93 because it's mm. like, I think of like early 2000s. Right, right. And that's why I bring them up again, yeah, actually, in the sure. 2000s. <laughs> yeah. Long, uh, they stuck with it. Yeah, they did. And then I also want to mention country because country music is something that is, is so is so big, but we haven't actually seen um, too many female drummers within the country music hmm. scene. And it continues to be a rarity in country music, with a few exceptions. So we have a drummer named Lisa Pancras, and she's one of the top country drummers today. And she's worked with a lot of famous country acts. And Michelle Joseph is another fascinating country crossover drummer. Uh, and she's also performed with artists like Emily Harris and Etta James. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, country, that's that's a really good point, because like it's very steeped in like tradition. And I think you hear about things where it's like, oh, they can't ex singer can't be in the uh, uh like the country like music awards because of this reason or they're not allowed to do this mm-hmm. because of this and it's it's i'm sure it's the same for drummers um but right and maybe that's why we don't see so many female drummers yeah in yeah in that genre yeah yeah i think you're right okay and then we have some some harder hitting drummers that i just want to mention here as well and we have stephanie Eulenberg and uh and she she's the she's the drummer in the all female band uh, Vixen, which I mentioned before. So this is another drummer that was also in the band, mm-hmm. and uh, and she and she's also like later on she so, so she she's also playing with Kid Rock, and Kid Rock has gone from new metal to hip hop to country balance. So it's been a very versatile role to fill behind the drums, and her drumming style ranges from like wild hard rock and heavy metal drumming to gentle country drumming. Yeah, and she also includes electronic sampler pads in in the live performances. And then we also have uh, drummer sensation Maytel Cohen, um, which is one of the and uh, she's one of the founding members of the American heavy metal band Maytel. She moved to I- from Israel to LA at the at age twenty to pursue a career in drumming, and She's actually like she really blew up on YouTube, yes. and that was after posting an audition tape for America Scott Talent on her YouTube, and suddenly she found herself a YouTube s- sensation. Yeah, <laughs> and started uploading more videos, and today she has almost two million YouTube followers. Um, yeah. and she has also done a studio album uh, called Alchemy, and that peaked on the Billboard and Hard Rock charts. And she's also released an instructional drum DVD set and digital training pack na- named Maximum Metal for anyone that wants to check that out. It, she's amazing. And just like, I'm sure it's going to come up in other spots, but like the YouTube thing, it seems like it's like you have the opportunity as a guy or a girl or wh- whoever to like not be held back by uh, yeah. Yeah. some management or something. It's like if you and you know this, I know this. No matter what you're doing on Instagram or Facebook or YouTube or podcast, it's a ton of work. And oh, if you put in the work, <laughs> then um, people typically will, if you're good and, you know, if people like it, they'll, they'll, they'll kind of come to you. And there's nothing holding you back now with, with YouTube, which I think is just amazing. It's amazing. And actually a big part of my last episode of this whole series is talking about that. Then it's talking about 
how the the industry is really changing and how and how we actually now see so many more women than we ever have before and influencers you know yeah. women online that are really taking over yeah. and and it, it's interesting it's an interesting phenomenon that is happening now totally absolutely you're a yeah. part of it i mean for sh without a doubt you are oh, a part of it you. and uh, <laughs> doing a good job so before we get there, I just want to mention Meg White. Don't even need to say much about her. Yeah. She's also someone who's definitely just worth bringing into the conversation because because of the exposure that the band got and also because she, I know that she gets a lot of stick because she only started playing the drums as she joined White Stripe. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, but is she in some ways also demonstrated that, you know, drumming is about holding down a beat you know yeah you know she almost gets the like the like uh ringo treatment where people will be like well, mm -hmm. ringo's not a good drummer and it's like yeah, yeah. he is well I, yeah. I mean i think ringo is an awesome drummer and so is meg white Me too. But she's like yeah i don't know she kind of gets like the butt of like a joke almost where she's so yeah. basic with what she plays but it's perfect yeah. for that band for the exactly that's what why is their music so huge yeah she's a big part of that yeah what you not know? to play is almost yeah. It's important of yeah. what you play. I couldn't imagine it being more showy and like even more symbols than there are. And, and just, um, it's, it's perfect. Yeah. It's a little bit like the Mo Tucker philosophy, exactly. you know? Yep. Yeah. And then we also have Samantha Maloney, who is also in that documentary count me in. Yes. And she's also someone that is definitely, uh, worth, mentioning and she she's been playing with Motley Crue for example and she's the drummer on their live DVD uh of the new tattoo tour and she's talking about how she got that gig in the Count Me In documentary which is quite interesting yeah. yep <laughs> and then we have Carla Azar she's a drummer and multi-instrumentalist uh and she played in the alternative rock band Auto Lux and she's also toured with Jack White's touring band The Peacocks uh, after the white stripes when he went out and he had like an all male set a, a lineup and an all female lineup on out on tour at the same time yeah. yep yeah i think that's it from the from the 2000s so then we're moving into this last decade and current times and um and it's 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 interesting it's weird and interesting times that we we live in there's been like a big social and cultural shift in areas of women's rights mm -hmm. and gender equality as well as technological shifts in music and drumming and the past two decades of rapid innovation in digital technologies have disrupted the music in business at every level yeah. and technology has changed how people create and listen to music composers can now produce film scores from their home studios and especially also with this global pandemic that we've had musicians had to really rethink how they can reach their audiences and we now see more musicians play for fans around the world through live stream performances and just using social media like we talked about really as a as a powerful tool um and we've also seen a massive upswing with with huge influencers on social media which is given a new path for female drummers to make themselves heard and this in turn inspires a whole new generation to pick up the sticks and start playing because they can finally see role models that they identify with on a bigger scale than ever before and we also see studies in the positive impacts of drumming on our well-being which i think is amazing yeah. and that's something that is becoming more and more i hope that more and more people will pick up the, uh, the sticks not necessarily to think that they will become a full-time musician but just because they know that it will make them happier it will improve their their well-being yeah i mean it's like physically good for you it's it's everything and i mean that's again that's across that's for any anyone but the the accessibility to people too is so much like we just kind of mentioned a couple minutes ago with youtube like I think of when I first saw you, it's so weird how like one video that's like, I think it was a video and I'm sure you know what I'm talking about, where it was at Nam, I think, or, yeah. or something. And you're sitting there and you kind of have like tinted glasses and you're playing. Yeah. And it's like, I think it went viral and, and it showed up on everyone's like social media. But <laughs> then you're like, then I knew who you were and like. As opposed mm -hmm. to it being like on the radio or so where like I wouldn't even know yeah. who the drummer was. It's just such a cool yeah. opportunity 
Yeah. And then fast forward, you know, a year or two or whatever, however long that ago was. And like now we're doing this interview. It's just such a smaller world. And I hope it's It's more inclusive. It seems like it is. I mean, what's your take as we kind of are coming towards the Oh, a lot more inclusive. And I feel like, you know, all these Big entities like the BBC, for example, I can see how they are really putting active effort in their programming to represent more more diversity on the screen. Yeah, you know, yeah. and that and and I and I know that from like gig offers that I've had or gig offers that my mates have had. I can see it. I can actively see it changing as of literally the past sort of four. Or four or five years so it's it's it's, a, it's quite new where i can but i can see that there is like really active effort put into that which is incredible it makes me so happy yeah for sure and i just kind of was like looking real quick to it i think it was the welch tuning system video where you're playing yeah. is what i was talking about oh, so that's just i didn't even know you've seen that oh my that's God. so funny. i don't know why it must have gotten shared on one of those like Wow. pages that and again it's like maybe on drum talk tv no? yeah i'm sure and that probably reached a ton maybe. of people um so oh, you never know funny. and i've seen that with other <laughs> female drummers uh other yeah. men as well but like female drummers where like there was one video of like a cover and then they just kind of blew up and now they're like a part of the like uh the scene um mm-hmm. so it's it's a cool and time. talking about blowing up through social media Nandy Bushel, yes. eleven-year-old Nandy. Oh my God, she is a social media celebrity yeah. who's taken the world by storm yes. with her drumming skills, and she's achieved more than most drummers would dream <laughs> of in a lifelong career. Yeah. Performing with musicians like Lenny Kravitz, like performing with the Foo Fighters, uh, yeah. with Dave Grohl. I, I was crying when I watched yeah. that video. It's so cool. Yeah, and it and it gives me so much just like faith and and hope for the future. The future is really exciting, I think, when it comes to drummers. And we see some other incredible kids on the rise as well, including Yoyoka, Geneva, London, Cheetah, Annabelle. There's like a few of them, and they're all active on on social media because that's 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 where we're at today, isn't it? Yeah, totally. And people love to see. Uh, really talented kids. I think that that goes back to you know hundred thousands of years ago. People like when a kid is good at <laughs> something, but now we can all see it and uh, and share it and and hopefully be yeah. positive in the comments. You know what I mean? And and yeah. um, and just kind of praise them and, and hopefully keep it going because there are some uh, in a good way freakishly talented kids out there now. Um, oh, I know it's scary. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. scary. <laughs> <laughs> and then just a few other drummers. I'm just going to mention their names because there's like so many today, you know? Yeah. Um, but also in the last episode of uh, of Drumming Through the Decades, uh, I will have a list in the description of more drummers that I couldn't even fit in and mention in this episode just because I want people to go and check out yeah. all of them and and i wanted to feature all of them but it was just impossible which is a good sign totally. that's a great yeah. sign you know but a few of names i'm just gonna drop is annika nails yeah charisse say caitlin califas helen de la rosa emmanuel caplet pocket queen madame gandhi cora coleman dunham uh darkest curry jordan west lada o- obradovic Lee Paying, Val Sepulveda, and then some UK drummers. We have Haley Kramer, Louis Bartle, Africa Green, Simone Oda- 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 Odaranel, Holly Madge, Asia Dijeli, Lucy Landimore, Sarah Lee Shaw, Ree Williams, Lee Gerald- Leah Geraldine, Remy Graves, Vanessa Dominic, and so on. And there are so many more on this list, but that's just a few. Yeah are all incredible and and very inspiring totally. to follow and follow their journey vicky o'neon belongs on oh, that uh, that list and you. i mean you you are kind of the exactly along with all those other uh great female drummers i mean you kind of embody the um just what it's all about about trying to represent you know your let's you know your people and like make it uh bring it to the forefront and you're the real deal i do want to say that because i mean you are a working 
hardworking. I mean, even you have an, a, the, like a very cool image, which as you know, I'm sure everyone's probably seen you, but you can guess that it's very neon and it's very <laughs> bright. It, is, yeah. it takes a lot, <laughs> a lot of lot work. Of I mean, you're, you're, you uh, it doesn't. I'm a total workaholic. Yes, I can tell. But I'm just happy to have found something that I'm just so passionate about and I love. And it's and it's drumming. You know, drumming. It's the first drum is on on Earth was the heartbeat. Yep. You know, it's it's inside of all of us. It's such an incredible thing to be passionate about. You know, yeah, we're and lucky. then and then. Yeah, we are. We're so lucky. And and then being a woman, it only comes naturally to me to then bring the stories of of women to the forefront and really inspire other women and and learn from women before us. So it's a beautiful combination of 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 these things that I get to do. Yeah. Man. Very well said. So um this has been an unbelievable episode that if I'm, I'm hoping, you know, people have loved it as much as I have, cause it's, it's given so much like, uh, homework to, to look into <laughs> for so many great drummers. Um, and I will share in the description, um, I mentioned something before that I'll share Oh, for the drummer, the girl Alliance. And then I will, um, also share the amazing, you know, YouTube series drumming through the decades and Vicky's website and all that great stuff. Um, I amazing. Yeah, Vicky, I appreciate you taking all this time because I mean, it's like you're five hours ahead of me. So it's, you know, mm -hmm. 1030 or so there. Uh, 1130. It's 1130. <laughs> my math is wrong. <laughs> so thanks for, for, you know. Yeah, of course. I'm I'm happy that I can share this and the more people that hear this and can be inspired by it. It's great. And I also wanted to say that there will be, in the last episode of, of Drumming Through the Decades, there is a lot of links in that description as well to platforms that are there today that people can join, that people can become a part of. That's great. Because people don't know if they, you know, you got to help direct people in the right uh, right direction, which you have done this entire episode. So. Yeah, Vicky. Well, again, thank you so much for um, kind of hanging out late with me in your neck of the woods. And um, I'm excited for people to hear this. And hopefully one day we can meet at one of the conventions or something. And, and that would be a blast. Oh, so, yeah. Well, thank you for being yeah. here. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you for having me. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning.